what I would call different expressions of the Spirit. How God chooses to reveal His presence among us. Just a few moments ago, the instruments were beating a whole lot faster, and this place was filled with a very victorious praise. And now we have transitioned into what in the natural realm some might call solemnness or solitude, but in fact, I believe what we're in right now is what I would call God's absolute authority. Peace is the truest sign of God's authority. Not the loud instruments, not the dance, not the run, but peace is the truest sign of God's authority. That's why when the disciples are fearful for their life, when the storm is overtaking their ship, where do they find the Lord? Asleep in the bottom of the boat. Because he knows full well that I have all power and all authority over this storm. And so while they're overcome with anxiousness and fear and worry has filled their soul, they find their Lord in a state of perfect peace. It's not the only instance. In fact, if you were to go all the way to the end of the book in Revelation, you would find that it describes the heavens. Before the throne of God, it says there is a sea of glass like unto crystal. The water before His presence is so still that it's like looking into a piece of clear glass because there is nothing that you can bring into the presence of God that can disrupt the stillness of those waters because He has all power and all authority over everything. And so I don't want you to feel like because the expression of the Spirit has shifted in this environment that miracles can't happen, that God, not, not, I'm telling you what, what has happened is God has moved us into a realm where His absolute authority is present. And where His authority is, anything can happen. Anything can happen. I wish you'd just lift up your hands one more time. Would you lift up your voice with your hands and would you just begin to reach out to God? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Araye loye ya ata eshamande ikuri ana masoko nala maha ikaye yoto roku sahane iana makosha nala makia naye. Lord, we know that you are here right now. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I want to direct your attention to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 16. I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9. Let me say one more time what an honor it has been to be back in Hamilton at Life Point with you over this weekend. And, uh, it's always an honor to be invited somewhere once, uh, but when you get the high honor to come back a second time, that is truly a compliment and a privilege. And I've so appreciated the opportunity to be here with your pastor, my good friend Adam and Stephanie, my buddy Judah. That's a good kid right there. And uh, just the ministry team and many friends in this church. And I give God praise for what he's doing. I really feel, I really feel like God wants to talk to us tonight. In fact, at the, the hotel room this afternoon, I kind of wrestled with the Lord. And I said, God, some of what I, I feel to say, I think has already been said. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, I feel... I feel great urgency in the Spirit. And to speak frankly with you, I, I don't know if I'm convinced and maybe the Holy Ghost is not convinced that you entirely perceive what He is trying to do among you. And I feel commissioned by God tonight to try to help you understand the urgency in the spirit for what God has promised this church and what he is desiring to do. Paul writes to that church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8. He says, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. 
Now, I understand that when he says Pentecost, he is referring to a date on the calendar. He's talking about a feast that those people would celebrate. But it's because that feast had spiritual significance, especially to those New Testament believers after the Holy Ghost had them poured out on the day of Pentecost. It was what we might call a a birthday or a church anniversary. It was a time of celebration. It had always been a time of celebration, but so much more now that the day of Pentecost had fully come. And so Paul is saying, I'm going to tarry at Ephesus until that time of celebration comes again. In verse 9, he says, There is a great door, an effectual that is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. He says, There's a great door. There's an effective door. It's open to me right now. Yeah, there are many adversaries. He just kind of threw that in for the critics in the crowd that, that, you know, the pessimistic one, the one who always points out the obvious negative thing when vision is declared. Paul says, yeah, I know. I know there's all kinds of obstacles. I know there's all kinds of opposition. I know there's adversaries. But I'm coming and I'm going to stay there because this is what I know. There is a great door, an effective door, God is open to me. I want to preach to you from this text and this title. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about a suddenly door. A suddenly door. Jesus, I thank you for what we feel in this house. I thank you for this great church and these wonderful people. I thank you for every prophecy that has been spoken over this assembly. I thank you for every promise that has been birthed in the heart of its leaders. But God, I pray tonight would be a moment of transition. We have looked through the windows of prophecy. Oh God. God, we have dreamed, we have prayed, we have preached, and we have declared. We have stared through the window of prophecy year upon year. But God, I know what I feel in the Holy Ghost. The door is open. Access is being granted. And I pray that as Paul did, that the eyes of our understanding would be opened through the spirit of wisdom and revelation to perceive what is happening among us right now. The opportunity that is before us right now. In the name of Jesus. Would you lift your hands to the Lord right now? Come on, if you've got any invested interest in this church, if your heart and your family is in this church, I want you to begin to cry out to God right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We give you praise. The Lord bless you. You can be seated. A door is simply a point of entry or exit. It's found, the word itself, 144 times in the Old Testament, 29 times in the New Testament, if you were to search the King James Bible. We find it early in the Scriptures when the Lord warns Cain, and He says, Sin lieth at the door, Genesis 4. And then all the way to the end of Scripture in Revelation 3, we read that Jesus is standing, knocking at the door. Many times the reference is physical, but there are a few very notable times in Scripture that the reference to a door has nothing to do with two-by-fours and hinges and door handles. But God uses our understanding of natural things to reveal to us the spiritual truth that just as I would pass through that door if I wanted to enter into the lobby of this church, 
that there are doors in the Spirit that take us from where we are to where He would desire we go. What do we need, I would propose this question, to discern and to maximize this moment? We need first the power to perceive what God is doing. And secondly, we need people who are willing to work with God regardless of the personal cost. Power to perceive what God is desiring to do in and through us right now. And once perceived, people who are willing to give all and do whatever to be a part of the plan and the purpose of God in this city. We need both the instinct to perceive it and the instruction to do it. I know that this church has a healthy diet of instruction. You don't have the quality of ministry by accident. God has placed an abundance of skilled and anointed ministry in this church. Ministers who are gifted to preach, to teach, to train, and to disciple. He has done this because it is necessary for us to have the instruction to know what to do. Instruction can come by example, by leadership. But the instinct can only come from within. Nobody can give you the instinct. You must carve it out yourself on your spiritual pursuit of God in knowing Him. You must carve out that place in your spirit where you begin to know God and know His ways, where you discern His will and understand His plan. Only you can get that instinct for yourself. Already this weekend, I have directed your attention to Exodus, the third chapter. But again tonight, I will do so. Where Moses is keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he leads that flock to the backside of the desert and comes to the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And as I've already said, this is not an unordinary thing. It is somewhat common for a bush to be in flames in the middle of that dry, barren desert. But what has captured his attention in this moment is that the bush is burned with fire. But as the Bible says, it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. Not only why with his words, but why with his actions. He did not simply inquire of God by statement or question, but he inquired of God by his action, by stopping what he had planned to do, by laying down his agenda and turning aside to see what God was potentially doing in this moment. And all of a sudden, the scripture says, when the Lord saw, in other words, when God saw that Moses perceived a uniqueness in this moment, he calls to him out of the bush of fire, Moses, Moses. And he responds, here am I. What an encounter with God. That's what we've gathered here for this weekend, isn't it? And Moses begins to discover God in a greater measure than any man had before. He begins to discover God's purpose and plan for his life. Moses, I hear the cry of my people. I need a man who has the capacity to entertain a future that's greater than the present they now live in. I would submit to you tonight the reason God could not raise up a man within the courts of Pharaoh, a man who was already in the, the camp where those Israelites were held captive. The reason God could not do such a thing was because they did not possess the capacity necessary 
to entertain that God would give them a good land and a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Their perspective of lordship or authority was so distorted by the cruel heart in the wicked agenda of Pharaoh that God knew, though you might possess the physical strength, you wouldn't believe me if I told you I had a good thing for you. You wouldn't believe me if I told you I was going to take you out of this Egyptian prison and take you to a land that you would lord over and you would be blessed in. God couldn't find somebody in there, so he had to raise up somebody on the outside. He said, Moses, your perspective has not been tainted by the wickedness of Pharaoh. Your life has not been tainted by the lack and the slavery and the bondage and the cruelty that your family has endured. Moses, I'm calling you because you have the capacity. Let me just talk plainly to you. I'm not trying to make any enemies in Ontario, but let me just tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost. You're not the biggest church in this district. You don't have the biggest names in this district. But there is an authority resting on this church. There has been prophecy uttered over this church that has positioned you at this hour and this moment for this purpose. You might not have the most money. You might not have the biggest building, but you hear me. You are strategically chosen of God because what you do have is a capacity. I'm telling you, just as real as God came to Moses, and Moses received a revelation of identity and purpose, God has sent me here tonight to try to pull the scales off your eyes, stir up that instinct within you so you understand who you are and what you have been given. It wasn't simply a burning bush. It was a door. It didn't look like that door. It wasn't framed up with two by four or two by six. There was no metal hinges. He couldn't find the door handle with this hand. It was a door in the spirit. He stepped through a realm where he encountered God in a way nobody had before, where he began to know things about God nobody had known before, but they didn't violate the earlier revelations. Now hear me, let me just throw this in. There is no revelation of God you will receive that will be contrary to the revelation already given. But we don't know all about God he wants us to know. He began to show Moses things about himself and he began to show Moses things about his purpose and his calling and the people to whom he would serve. All because Moses perceived that there was something supernatural happening in that very moment. In many ways, it was ordinary, but in one easily overlooked way, there was this supernatural thing that Moses began to inquire of, and God responded. He perceives, and because he perceives, instruction can be given. I tell you tonight, God is trying to help us to perceive what he is doing through us right now. His inquiry of this moment is an indication of his discernment that God is trying to do something right now. His willingness to turn aside and look at the bush and, and see what's happening lets God know, Moses, there's something inside of you that perceives there is a greater thing happening. I ask you tonight, can you perceive it? Do you have the capacity to understand that there's more to this moment than a Sunday night church service? That there's more to this moment than just another event on the calendar? That there's something and sovereign and distinctly supernatural that God is trying to do. The perception to perceive the things of God cannot be overstated. There was a woman from Shunem in 2 Kings 4 who perceived something different on the prophet when he walked by. She said, honey, I perceive this is a holy man of God 
I've seen them walk by this house before. I've seen them pass through the village a time or two before. But I'll tell you what we got to do. Honey, go get the tools out of the shed. Go down to the market and buy a little bit of lumber. We got to make some necessary renovations that the next time this prophet of God comes through, we can invite him into our house and we can let him stay a little while because she perceived it's not enough to entertain a passing blessing. I want to have a habitat with the things of God all because she perceived in a moment of time as he was passing through that there was something distinctly different about that man and so she does what must be done to make a little room in her house if I could give you a little bit of instruction tonight I would tell you that we need to make and begin to make the necessary adjustments to entertain holy things in our homes. It's already been echoed many times from this pulpit this weekend. Pastor's emphasis on prayer and fasting, I'll tell you what he's doing. He's trying to position the church to perceive and receive the holy things that are passing us by. So it becomes more than a passing blessing on a Sunday morning. But there's something that you've carved out in your home that that you've made room for what God is doing. That you don't just come here and get a little something, but you take it home and it forms who you are and what you do every day of the week. Because here's what you've got to understand. The possibility of your miracle is determined by your ability to perceive the work of God in a moment of time. That God could come at a precise moment for a specific work. But your ability to receive is entirely dependent on if you perceive what he's doing in that moment. Acts 14 and 27. said when they were come they had gathered the church together and rehearsed all that God had done with them. They began to talk. Do you remember when she received the Holy Ghost? Do you remember when God healed him? Do you remember when that prophecy was given? And they began to talk about all that God had done and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. The Bible is not talking about a 32-inch door framed up with wood. It's a spiritual door. Or 2 Corinthians 2 and 12, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Again, he's not saying that when I came to the border of the land of Troas that I had to walk through this 32-inch door or 36-inch door. I, I didn't have to push the button and wait for the gates to open. He's talking about a spiritual door. Colossians 4 and 3. With all, praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance. To speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. Again, he's not talking about a physical door. And so it becomes very apparent in the work of those New Testament apostles. That their mission, their understanding of where God was working and what God was doing was dependent upon their ability to perceive the spiritual door he had opened both where it was and when it was open. And as they would perceive the work of God, they would move to these locations. Churches would be established. Souls would be saved. The kingdom of God would go forward, all because they perceived the door, its location, and its time. And so tonight, we must discern the door. The blessing of a spiritual door is also the frustration. It is completely invisible. You can't determine the location or the timing of a spiritual door by what you see with your natural eye or what you feel in your flesh. A spiritual door is completely invisible. And so if you do not perceive it, what happens is you become frustrated at your circumstance and you become angry at God 
if you're not careful. A root of bitterness will form as you begin to question God. How dare you allow me to go through this? God, why would you do this? And if you do not possess the instinct and the discernment to find God's door for your life, then what happens is because of its invisibility, you become frustrated. You feel like you can't see your way out of where you are or into where God wants to take you. But hear me today. The reality is it might be closer than you think. I can't see it anywhere. I can't, I can't find it. I can't, I can't make sense of it. How do we ever get out of here and get to where God is taking us? You have to perceive the door. You're not going to find it with your natural eye. You're not going to make sense of it with your natural feelings. This is spiritually discerned, spiritually discovered, spiritually found. When the eyes of our understanding are open and we walk in the Spirit, God will lead us to the open door. And so, let me speak to that person tonight that is frustrated. Be careful, because frustration will become the tool of the enemy that he uses to blind you to the door that is right before you. You could be as close to the open door as I am to this. But if you are frustrated with the adversaries around the door, you will be blind to the open door God has put there. Paul said, I know there's all kinds of opposition, but this is also what I know. There is an open door. So we cannot allow our frustrations, our doubts, and our uncertainties to blind us to the truth that the door is near and the time is now. In Acts chapter 16, the Bible said they had gone throughout the region of Phrygia, the region of Galatia, verse 6 and 7, but were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. And after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. What's happening here is they are looking at this land that needs the gospel. They are looking at people that need to be born again. And they say, you know what? We've been called to preach. And these are people who need to hear the gospel. It only makes sense that we go. Their need was there. The intention was good. But the reality is, is that a good idea is not always a God idea. They were measuring their direction on what was naturally perceived. And though it was a good thing, it was not a God thing. And the Holy Ghost said, I know there's a need, I know there is opportunity, but the answer is no. And then, in a vision, the Lord begins to speak to Paul about the land of Macedonia. He had wanted to go one place because of what he saw in the flesh. And God said, no. And when he died out to the feeling of his flesh, then by vision or the eye of the Spirit, God said, here is what I need you to do. And so he makes his way to Macedonia. And when they come to the chief city of Philippi, the Bible said it was a chief city of Macedonia. They encountered a lady named Lydia, and this is what the Bible said. She was a lady whose heart the Lord had opened. Because spiritually open doors always lead the way to spiritually open hearts. Look, I'm not an old man. I've not been in this a long time. But I've been in it long enough to interact with a lot of preachers, a lot of saints 
who have frustrated themselves and fallen short of their God-given potential because they are constantly chasing what their natural eye sees, lacking spiritual vision, lacking spiritual direction, frustrated with the ineffectiveness and the lack of fruit of their ministry. You hear me right now. That's because they are knocking on the hearts of humans whose the door of their heart has not been open. But when you walk through a spiritually open door, on the other side of every door in the spirit is a human heart that God has already opened. And if God had not abruptly stopped their voyage into Asia, then they would have missed the doorway into the city of Philippi, and they would have missed the opportunity to reach this lady named Lydia. And all of a sudden, this unthinkable thing happens. As Paul and Silas, who are doing what God has called them to do, are seized by the Romans, violently dragged into the city, accused of violating laws and customs of the Romans. And this is what the scripture says. The multitude rises up against them. The magistrates ripped their clothes off and commanded them to be beaten. Wait a minute. God opened this door and I'm suffering persecution at the hands of the Romans. That doesn't seem fair. But you hear me. God's not fair. Fairness is a human quality. God cannot be measured on human quality. And the truth is, is that spiritual doorways are more times than not hidden in the adversity and the conflict of life. And it's when we become overcome with the pressure and the struggle that the enemy begins to manipulate our emotions to blind us to the truth that there is a door in the spirit. Hear me somebody tonight, this is what the enemy knows. He can see in the spirit because that is his habitation. We enter into the spirit, but we must do it through the veil of the flesh. And so we've got to pray a little bit and fast a little bit to crucify the flesh, to see clearly in the spirit. And so sometimes what is difficult for you and I to perceive is very plain to our enemy. And he knows if he could put enough adversity in your path to frustrate you and to manipulate your feelings, then there is a good chance that you will become more consumed with the adversaries around the door than the open door that's right before you. Man. They're doing a good thing, preaching the gospel. And now they find themselves thrown into a prison. But hear me, opportunities are always matters of perception. What one person calls opposition, another person can call opportunity. It simply depends how you perceive the work of God. So you must have the ability to perceive what God is doing in a moment of time as a God-given opportunity. It would be nice if an opportunity introduced itself as such. Hi, I am an opportunity. That would make this a whole lot easier. But the reality is, is that opportunities often come deeply veiled in the adversity and the conflict of life. You could say it like this, that opposition is the suit, but underneath the coat is God-given opportunity. Because if we could calculate this and do this by human logic and human ability, there would not be much need for God, would there? And so in Acts 16 and 25, we know this scripture. We sang a song tonight written in reference of this scripture. But they're there in the jail cell. 
And the Bible says at midnight, Paul and Silas pray. They began to sing praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Now, I don't know. I don't know. But I like to think this is probably how it played out. They got sitting there. And they had been beaten. They're bloody. Their bodies bruised. They're probably hungry. They're weak. They're tired. Maybe even feeling a little bit frustrated. And maybe the conversation started something like this. You know, Paul, it just doesn't seem fair that we would have to endure this when trying to go about the work of God. It doesn't seem fair that we would have to endure this kind of pain and rejection and hardship and, and that the fight should be this difficult when we're just trying to do what God told us to do. Yes, so... That's right. There's been a lot of opposition on this journey. But Saul, do you remember that revival a couple years ago? Do you remember that drug addict that God delivered? Saul, do you remember that time we, we laid hands on that blind man and God restored his sight? And all of a sudden, when they began to redirect their attention off of the opposition and on to God, they were able to perceive the opportunity that was before them. Man, you know, Paul, now that I think about it, God's been pretty good to us, hasn't he? He sure has. He sure has. I know, I know it's been a hard day today, but when I look over the entirety of my life, yeah, God. God has been pretty good to me. You know, Saul, I can't really explain everything that's happened here today. It doesn't quite seem right. But you know, when I think back to what happened on that Damascus road, I think of what I used to be like. And when I think about where I came from, and when I think back to what life used to be, you know what, Saul? Hey, he's been pretty good to me. And the more they begin to talk about how good God had been, they said, you know what? The motivation to engage with God was restored. Questions begin to fade from the front of their mind. And they begin to sing praises to God. They begin to pray to God. All of a sudden, they realize that their spirituality wasn't confined to a location or to a time. And they discover that even though I'm in the prison, there's a door of escape from where I am. All of a sudden, the veil fell away. And they perceived the opportunity that was before them. Adversity put me in this place. But there's an opportunity here right now. And they begin to praise God. God, you've been good to me. God, you've been faithful to me. God, you have all power, all authority, and all dominion. And they begin to pray at midnight. At midnight. That word in Scripture to speak of utter darkness, that word to speak of all negativity, of the absence of light. The writer's trying to paint the picture for us that this is the worst of all times. But in the worst of all times, they discover the opportunity with the greatest of all gods. And there at midnight, they began to enter into the presence of God. They discovered that I might be locked up, but God is not locked up. I might might be bound but God is not bound I might not know how to get out but God can get in Hallelujah. utter hopelessness suffering infliction pain discomfort questions fear agony anxiety depression all of these things could have been present and robbed them to the divine opportunity that was before them. But they didn't fix their eyes on the shackles on their feet. They didn't fix their eyes or their ears on the sounds of chains on concrete. No, they didn't fix their eyes on that locked gated door before them. No, they lifted up their eyes and saw into the spirit and realized, I'm not bound the way it seems. There is a door of a Escape from where I am. Hatakoshatalamaha. Hikotorobo satalabaha kiti alamaha. 
You hear me right now. As much as God had opened the door for them to get into the city of Philippi, He had opened the door for them to get into this prison. They were spiritually positioned by God. And though they maybe didn't perceive it in the opening moments of this text, by the time they had a little bit of church, their perception had been altered. And they had discovered that as much as God opened the door to get me in here, He is about to open the door to get me out. And suddenly, just like that, suddenly, the Bible says there was a great earthquake. The ground began to shake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, tap your neighbor and say immediately, right now, in a moment of time, all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. In a moment of time, their ability to see past the opposition and perceive the opportunity that they were strategically placed by God in a place of discomfort, in a place of challenge, in a place of difficulty because God said, there's people there I need you to reach. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. The foundations of the prison start shaking. I'll tell you what's happening in the Holy Ghost. I feel it in this city. I walked down that street today to that coffee shop, and I was looking at all the homeless people on the street. I was looking at all these young, young adults caught up in humanism, all covered in, in all these images and ideas. And I can see the bondage on their face. I, I can see the sin in their life. I, I, can, I can see past all of that and feel the search in their spirit. I'll tell you what's happening right now. I speak into the spirit of this city. I'll tell you what is is happening. The foundations of strongholds are shaking. I know you might feel trapped. I know you might feel limited. I know you might feel at a disadvantage. I know you might feel like less than you are. But hear me right now. This is not simply opposition. It's divine opportunity. And the ground is about to shake. The very thing that held them hostage began to shake. You hear me? I'm talking about the wickedness, the spirit of perversion that has ensnared the thousands at McMaster University is shaking right now. The spirit of humanism that has empowered the entrepreneurial spirit of this city has also ensnared a generation in sin. Hear me right now. It is shaking. And I'm not talking about something God is going to do months or years from now. I'm trying to shake you a little bit to perceive that you are closer to the door than you realize. Get your eyes off the chains. Get your eyes off the prison. And look to the opportunity. It's about time we increase our definition of victory. The Bible didn't say one or two or ten got free. Everyone's bands were loosed. I'll tell you what the will of God is. The will of God is that every single addict be free. The will of God is that every single family be restored, be healthy. The will of God is every single alcoholic be delivered. The will of God is every drug addict be free. The will of God is every student be saved. That is the will of God. 
He didn't die for some. He died for all. I know. I know. I can feel it. There's some of you who say, well, we're never going to reach all. Yeah. But if you try, you'd reach a whole lot more than you are. Lift up your eyes to the fields. I'm telling you the vision of God is bigger than you entertain. And there is a door that is right before you that God has already opened. You don't need to do anything more than you're doing than simply perceive and act on the opportunity that God has given you. There is more at play than the prison you're sitting in. You are positioned by God for spiritual opportunity in this city. Oh, but preacher, you don't know what I feel like. That's the problem. Your response in the spirit to this moment in time has been dictated on what you feel and not what you know. Hear me right now. Freedom might not be your feeling, but it is your reality. And until you act in faith on the basis of what God has declared your reality is, you cannot receive it. Your feelings become a tool that the enemy has ensnared your faith by. We do not act on what we feel, but on the truth that we know. And whether we feel it or not, the reality is God has declared it. Now is the moment. Amen. What about that man at the pool of Bethesda that Jesus comes to? Well... You want to be made whole? Oh, I'd love to be made whole. There's just nobody to pick me up and take me down into the water when the angel has troubled. He believed that it could be done, but his faith was confined to the parameters of somebody else's experience with God. Oh, I believe it could happen. If God would do for us what he did for them. And we begin to allow our perspective of who God is and what he can do to be distorted. But what I would even go so far out to call the low level of somebody else's experience. Oh Jesus, I want to be made whole. I just have nobody to pick me up and take me down into the water. I can perceive the time but I have no way. And he's totally ignorant to the fact that the word made flesh is standing in front of him. He's trying to tell the word that he needs the water. When God's trying to say, if you've got a word, you don't need anything else. tell you what prophecy is. The Bible says that the entrance of his word cometh light. And prophecy is like a match being lit in a dark place. Let me tell you something about darkness. Darkness has no power over light. There is nothing darkness can do to dispel the brightness of the light. The only way darkness has any power is if light is absent. If this room was completely black, there was no source of light, so dark that you couldn't see me and I couldn't see you, we could light a single match. And the volume of darkness in this sanctuary could not dispel that tiny little light on the tip of a match. Because the only power darkness has over light is when light is absent. And when we allow ourselves to walk ignorant of our true identity and absent of the authority that is promised to us, we rob ourselves of the opportunities that God has given us. Here's a little exercise you ought to do when you get home tonight. I want you to walk into a room in your house. I want you to shut the door and turn the lights off so it's complete blackness. And I want you to turn that light off. Turn it off again. Turn it off turn it off again and just as simple as it is to flick that switch and light come in that room the same truth is 
spiritual. When you walk in the areas and the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost, you are light. It doesn't matter how much darkness there is. It doesn't matter how great the darkness is, even the littlest bit of light. And what happens when a prophecy is uttered or a promise is given, the Bible says at the entrance of his word cometh light. It's like God puts light in a dark place. Do you know why he does that? So people in their darkness have a reference point, a light that they can search out, something that they can find. And the more people People that connect with the light, the brighter the light becomes. The more pieces of wood you put on the fire, the bigger the fire becomes. And what has happened is there has been prophecy and promise spoken over us and over us and over us in light and light and light. But what must happen now is we must have that spiritual perception to realize a lot of these things that God has said he wants to do. It's not some distant future. It's right now. There is an open door right now. <laughs> now is the moment. We say, but there's so many questions that I don't have answers for. I know. I know. Trust me. I'm living there right now. There's a lot of things. I have no way in my finite mind to comprehend how God can possibly do this. But what I do know is when I see a light in a dark place, I've got to go after it. You don't need somebody to carry you into the water. When you have a word from God. I don't have time to tell you the whole story tonight, but I remember September 2014 when God spoke to our church. We're going to give, God said, I'm going to give you a million dollar building you did not build and did not pay for. We called every dying denominal church in the city thinking they're going to rent to us. All those old people were going to die and the pastor's going to say, here, take your building. There wasn't a single church that would rent to us. And then we just kept going in the hotel week after week, declaring the prophecy, believing the word of the Lord. God is going to do what he said. Until November of 2015, on that last Sunday, the Holy Ghost spoke to me in that altar service. And God said, the foundation of this church is now complete. I will give you the building I promised to house the revival I'm sending this city. Six weeks later, we were approached by a pastor of another church. And about five months later, we signed the documents. Owners of a $1.7 million building. We didn't build it. We didn't pay for it. Sanctuary's got 200 chairs in it. It was far beyond what we needed at that season, but God has blessed it. And in the past few months, there's only been three or four Sundays. We've had less than 100 people. Let me tell you, I know something about how God works. And you hear me right now. If you've got a word from God, you don't need anything else. Here is what I feel like the Holy Ghost would like to say to us tonight as I get ready to close. Acts 16 and 29, at the conclusion of that story, the Bible speaks of the jailer who just moments prior had been standing guard at the prison where those apostles were stuck. And the Bible said he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul. In silence. In one moment of time, in a suddenly moment, he who had held them hostage bowed in their presence. That's how quickly God can turn the table if you perceive the door. He who just moments prior had arrogantly stood guard at that locked cell, probably having a weapon in his hand, knowing he had these apostles under control, knowing they couldn't preach, they couldn't do what God called them to do. He was the one tasked with the great responsibility to hinder the work of God until God said, now is the time. The ground begin to shake and the prison doors are open and everyone in there is free. He calls for a light. Because what happens when strongholds are broken is people start looking for a light. You hear me?
Because what's about to happen in this region is some strongholds that have long hindered us, that are shaking right now, are about to be broken. And the things that we have held, been held hostage by, the things we have felt hindered by, are about to come kneeling before us because God is taking the authority off our adversary and putting it back on the children of God where it belongs. You think my purpose is going to be stopped by a jail cell in a jailer? Watch what I can do if you simply perceive the opportunity. And in a moment of time, the thing that held them hostage, they had the opportunity to help. Many times God allows adversity in our life to prove our character and to test our motive. To make sure that when authority is placed in our hands that we are moved by love and not by vengeance. Because it is not the will of God that the things and those who have hindered us or hurt us be hurt by us. But when God does the switching of hands and puts his power and authority to the people of God, to the place it belongs, he is doing that so we can help them. God says, I've done this. So when the drug addict comes in, they're not judged. They're not condemned. They're helped. Anybody in this house who's ever gone through sickness before, you've ever gone through hardship, you know it's not fun. You'd never wish it on anybody. But if you'll be honest with yourself, what you can say is this. As God did some things in me through the struggle that I might not have got any other way. You know, in Acts 16, there's a profound thing that happens. They're going about doing the work of God. And in just 15 or 16 verses... We find that as they go to prayer, there is a woman possessed of a devil who begins to wreak havoc. And then 15 or 16 verses later, they go to prayer again, and the physical ground begins to shake. This is what God is trying to show us, that there is such power and such authority when my people pray that there is no physical or spiritual reality that I cannot alter. There is no stronghold I cannot bring down. There is no addiction I cannot break. There is no circumstance I cannot change. Hear me right now. I'm talking about God putting a measure of authority on this church that when you get in that place of prayer, you can call things into existence. You can speak things as though they are not, and God will honor you. I'll tell you, it's what the Holy Ghost spoke to me. When we were in that season of miracle with our building, God said, I am gifting you the faith that is necessary to prophesy things beyond the measure of your investment. A church of 35 people that was only a few years old certainly didn't have the money or the resource or the heritage or the history or the need of a building that size at that time. But God said, because you can only prophesy according to the proportion of your faith, I'm going to gift you the faith that is necessary to speak the thing that you need, not only for where you are, but for where you're going. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about God putting such a measure of authority on this church that when you need a miracle, that when you need money, if you want a new building, if you want to move, you want me to tell you how simple it is? You get in this altar with your eyes of your understanding being open to the measure of authority that God has placed upon you. And you get in that place of prayer. And when you feel the spirit begin to bear witness and the tongue of prayer begins to change and you can feel that authority that was in this house just a little while ago as we begin to pray. You begin to speak things and you know what happens? Hell takes notice. And he realizes all this property that I've had my hands on, I can't have it on anymore because God has loosed his children. He Come on, what do you have need of tonight? Let me give you this last principle. Revelation 4. Keep in mind this is entirely spiritual. 
John wrote the book of Revelation when he got taken into the spirit. He said, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. I got in the spirit. A door was opened. A voice came forth and showed me what was coming after. Now you hear me right now. If you can get in the spirit and perceive that door and hear his voice and allow God to give you a vision. I'm not talking about looking at where the need is. There are always needs. I'm talking about seeing in the spirit what God is doing, what God is saying. And on the basis on the authority of that vision, if you can begin to speak things. My God, there's a lot of things I could tell you about. I don't have time to give you this whole story. But several years ago, the Lord spoke to me about the nations of the earth. One day in prayer, God said, I have talked to you about cities, but now I'm going to begin to talk to you about nations. And I became youth president, and you know, it's just a bunch of hoorah. But I like to know why God does what he does. One day in prayer, I said, God, why have you allowed this to happen? This is just a couple years ago. God said, I granted you this opportunity for a season because I had to take your feet physically to where I had already taken you spiritually. We've been overseas four or five different times in the past few years. I have walked in the fulfillment of prophecy. But I'll tell you where it started. It started in prayer one day when I got in the spirit and I began to see things and I began to speak things. And God is doing some things right now and opening doors of opportunities and connections around the world for our hands to be in the nations of the earth. I'm telling you this to tell you that I personally know what it's like for prophecy to come into my world, to see into the Spirit, to grab a hold of something from God, and to walk into the fulfillment of a word from God. I don't know what prophecies God has spoken over this church. I don't know what promises that you've been waiting on God to fulfill. Brother Shaw, I don't know what things you've been waiting on God, but this is what I do know. This church right now is standing before open door and there's a lot of things that we can't make sense of there's a lot of things that are going to be hard to calculate and figure out with our logical mind but you hear me if you have a word you don't need anybody to carry you into the water and so just like Jesus stood before that man at the pool of Bethesda said do you want to be made whole I ask this church tonight, do you want the fulfillment of what God has promised you? You don't need anything more than you have right now. You just need to begin to act in faith on the reality of what has been declared and seen in the Spirit. And I'm telling you, God is about to bring some major changes to the face and the function of this church in this city. I want you to stand together with me. Why don't you lift up your hands and begin to reach out to God. Come on, begin to reach out to God. Let this whole house become a place of prayer right now. Yanarama, Sikiya, Kayanarama, Koshatanda, Labaha. 
Come on, I'm telling this church that just as strategic as Moses was to the children of Israel, just as strategic as Moses was in his day, in his hour, so are you. You are called because God sees the capacity. Come on, take your eyes off your sick.